Hey everybody, this is Simon from Insider Divers and in today's Insider Academy talk, I've got here Tobias Friedrich, one of the very best underwater photographers that we have in the world. Uh, he's won pretty much anything that there is in terms of awards. He's been printed in all magazines. He's now a judge on our number one uh, underwater photo competition that we have. He really is one of the best of the best and he is an insider because he is going to be running a uh, expedition with me to Norway uh, this year, November, November 2022. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very chuffed to introduce you to you today, uh, Tobias, and he's going to be talking with me about cold water underwater photography. So yeah, let's welcome him right now. <music> Hi, <laughs> How is it going? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. <laughs> very good. Okay, I'm just going to set this right here. So where are you at? Are you in Germany or? Yes, I'm currently uh, in Germany right now. <laughs> All right. What was your last trip? Uh, fine so far, yeah. I've been uh, in the warm waters of Dominica and the Caribbean so and to photograph some sperm whales. So that was uh, really, really nice and really good. <laughs> Sperm whales. So how many days did you go there? Um, just a week um, in Dominica. And uh, yeah, we, went, we had uh, six days underwater and uh, every day, but one we saw sperm whales underwater as well. So that was really nice. Every day, except for one. Wow. Yes, yeah. Good. And good interactions or like, are they... Yeah, I mean, for me as a photographer, it can always be much better, you know this, yeah, so we are, like, uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't be complaining, but it's still always like, ah, I could be here a bit better, we're never, if you would be satisfied already after the, after one trip, then, then I think <laughs> you're not it's a like, photographer. Wait, just wait, wait, <laughs> yeah. <Come> on, wait. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, but, it was really nice, uh, really good, yeah. But it must have been very different from like, you know. Norway or something that we're going to be doing later this year when you're just board shorts and you know just warm water right yes yeah <laughs> so I was still wearing a dry uh, not a dry suit of course but a um in Dominica in the water I always like to have a wetsuit on me with a hood so that you're protected at least from the sun and it doesn't really get uh warm or so you just need to lift a little bit the suit then and then it's already all you're right. wearing the suit the whole time in dominica yes yeah really? wow. <laughs> yeah yeah I, but i'm freezing also fast i have to say <laughs> wow. even in dominica well that's that's interesting because we're talking about cold water so if you so you say you're you get cold easy yes Yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a lot about mindset and if you uh, deal with this or not, and, and so. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So you you say you're maybe somebody that gets cold easy. Yes, I, I would say so because my blood circulation is also not that good. Uh, so that means um, even in Greenland, my my hands and my feet are starting to get cold uh, quite quickly, actually. Yeah, so I have to really go against that, yeah, or like keep the hands up in the dry suit yeah, to get more air in, and so so I need to protect them really good <laughs> when I'm when I'm diving. So I mean, I'm assuming you've got the best equipment, so you still get cold. Yes, yeah, yeah, I do, I do, yeah. But it's also depending on, on what you really use and what you want to use. There are still possibilities. I mean, you can have like a heated vest if you want to have it on the dry suit, but you would always need to have the battery pack as well. So for me, it turned out that a little bit less and um, not like the hot, the, the warmest, what you can get is also okay because um, then you also don't have to, I mean, this is like, especially with the heated vest, it's one more thing what you have to take care of, what you need to take what you have to have with you um, especially in the flight so I rather have less equipment uh, and uh, 
then I'm I'm still able to hold that. Yeah, that's that's no problem. Yeah, it's it's there, as I said, a little bit of mindset as well. You need to go through it a little bit, push you as well. But if you want to have good pictures, sometimes you need to freeze as well. I mean, it's not only in the in the in the Arctic where you're where you're freezing. I'm now tomorrow. I'm flying to Egypt, and I will take my dry suit because uh, even in the warm waters of Egypt, you can still be. It can be still be freezing just because of the um, the cold wind and if you're wet yeah so you get cold very easily yeah so why why should why should you be freezing if you if you uh, uh, cannot as well yeah <laughs> i mean that's quite interesting that you say that you know uh you know i get cold but i still like cold water diving so that's something that i hear very often people are saying ah oh, really keen on whatever some something that's in the cold water like norway and then but i'm really afraid of the cold water so uh I guess it's worth it or what would you say to that yeah for sure yeah for sure yeah that was also one of the first reasons why i was uh going. that was actually greenland was my first trip um in the dry suit uh, i have to say because i wanted to uh, when i was starting as a diver i didn't have so much experience with the dry suit and i planned a trip with a friend um, to go to norway actually and to use our dry suit there in norway and we said okay if we can go to norway with a dry suit we can also go to greenland with a dry suit so, yeah. <laughs> so this is how it started because the outcome is so much not better but um, of course yeah for example in greenland or also in norway with the orcas you can't see that anyway is so good in warm waters so yeah? especially the cold waters are so interesting as well um that um uh, and especially with the icebergs in greenland as well that that's i mean you have to take the cold yeah i don't like it of course but it comes with it yeah it's it's not um at the end it's not the the biggest deal because you want to see the icebergs or you want to see the orcas in northern norway so um it's just a thing where you have to go through and but at one certain point of time you don't mind anymore yeah it it, it becomes the the less less priority in my eyes Okay. that you are freezing or that it's cold yeah but it can be so nice the landscape especially in in norway yeah when you uh, when you're going for the for the search of the orcas through the fjords with the liverboard and you can see everything and being you know this probably you can also be inside in the boat and just waiting and drink your hot coffee but being outside in the fresh air seeing the fjords yeah seeing all these all the sunset the sunrise going into the sunset the nice clouds formation yeah and everything is so colorful this is so nice it's it's i think in it, it's nature yeah? and you and you enjoy it everywhere it's even if it's a if it's a nice warm beach or in which beautiful palm trees or a super cold fjord in norway so i can enjoy with joy both but uh, very very good and actually i prefer the fjord i have to say even if it's cold but it's so nice huh? <laughs> cool okay well uh let's let's start talking about underwater photography uh in the cold water this is just a little bit of a warm-up chat so uh for everybody who's uh watching now uh, i would like to introduce tobias friedrich um from germany he is uh probably one of the most uh decorated uh, underwater photographers uh that we have i mean definitely in sort of our age group of course there's some guys that have been doing it much much longer than toby but toby has been doing photography for 15 years um first uh, you know sort of semi-professionally and become a professional underwater photographer quite a few years ago published quite a few books um has been involved in all kinds of projects if you want to go to his website you can check this amazingly long list of all of his awards it's like it's really crazy long list um and uh yeah to me uh, also a good friend and uh, inspiration with his photos so uh, everybody meets tobias nice to meet you everybody <laughs> okay um what i thought uh we would do i i picked a couple of my favorite photos uh from you cold water photos of course um and i <laughs> thought i'm just going to show through a couple, and maybe you can just say you know where this is what we're looking at but let's not go into too much detail um and then later we'll dive into some of those images and you know we can talk a bit about the background and how to make it possible and you know the conditions etc so i thought just to give everybody an idea of what's coming we're just going to go have a look at your awesome uh, underwater uh, pictures. So I'm going to just handhold this. <laughs> oh, here. Okay, so let's get started. First photo, my favorite. This is my absolute favorite photo from you, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, this is also from the latest trip um, to Greenland in 2019, where I did a big series with a freediver, Anna von Bötticher. But in this picture, um, it's not her, it's not a freediver, it's a regular diver. Uh, he's also quite good photographer, actually. It's uh, Alex Dawson, and um, yeah, he was uh, so kind uh, and was modeling for me here in this shot. And I said to him, "Please uh, hold your video lights underneath the iceberg." And there we go. Yeah. So this was obviously in Greenland, in the um, east coast, in uh, next to Tasilak, which is like the capital of East Greenland. So I didn't realize this was actually Alex Dawson. I've seen yeah. um, <laughs> it's quite funny, no? Wow. <laughs> That's quite funny that you have like, you know, high end guy to just be like as your model. I guess you you did it two ways. You you helped each other with like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. This is Alex is a super nice guy. So so uh, it was not much to to ask, actually. Yeah? And this is but this is when I'm traveling with other photographers or other people. Um, if, if you say or if you ask me if I can do anything for you or model for you for, for a shot, that it's absolutely no problem. Yeah. So, I mean, we help each other in that community. And I hope that goes for, for everybody here. And otherwise it wouldn't would be would be not a good idea. Yeah? <laughs> right. Yeah? And it's, we both benefit from this. <laughs> All right. This was this the same trip then? Um, was this the same trip with Anya or with exactly with Anna? Um, Anna von Bötticher is the model here, and this was actually a really nice series at the end um, about a free diver um, on an iceberg. And um, yeah, she was really really tough because I was um, of course in a full dry suit here in about minus two degrees of Celsius. Yeah, so salt water can be. Uh, I was freezing a little bit later, um, actually at um, zero point uh, or one point minus one point eight um, degrees Celsius, and she was only there in a six millimeter wetsuit and really suffering a little bit, of course. Yeah, but she she was the real hero from from that series, I would say, because she was really doing really well. And whatever I ask, if you if I suggested to her like swim another time, maybe around the iceberg, or I can do this again, or whatever, and she was always there and always saying yes, yes. And, no matter how how badly uh, she was freezing <laughs> so this was a really wow. nice experience and also for her really really nice images at the end i guess so good because you know without her you just wouldn't know what kind of size you're looking at you really need that person don't you Exactly. And this is actually also the first lesson in underwater photography or in cold water photography, um, especially when you're photographing wrecks or even better icebergs in this case, because with, with wrecks, you um, still do want to have like a little bit of a size comparison. So it's always good to have a diver next to a wreck to see how big that wreck actually is. But um, you can still predict on, on how big it should be approximately, I guess. But with icebergs, you have no idea if this is just a rock in your whiskey glass or if it's, uh, if it's the, the Titanic killer. Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah? But um, yeah, it was really a good idea. And, and to, at first, we didn't know um, when we started that, um, that trip or that expedition if, um, how the photos uh, would come out. But at the end, it was um, uh, really, really nice, actually. All right, then we've got this one here. Yes, <clears throat> this is also, sorry, uh, cold water. And um, this was actually in Iceland and also in the continental crack, but not in Silfra. Um, so Silfra is um, near Reykjavik in the south, southwest um, of Iceland. And, uh, but that crack, that continental crack, actually goes to the mid-Atlantic ridge. So it goes through the Atlantic Ocean. The, the whole thing, there's where the continental plates are separating between the Europe-Asian plate and the American plate. And that crack actually goes through Iceland. That is why, of course, Iceland is also volcanic and has a lot of eruptions. And this one is called Neskia, and it's also a continental crack, but in the northeast of, um, um, of Iceland. It's about two hours away from uh, Akureyri in the north, I would say. Cool. Um, then, of course, we've got this one here. Uh, hoping we're going to see that this year on our trip. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Hopefully to be in the water again in Norway with these uh, cute guys here. And uh, of course, it's an um, orca, a killer whale uh, in northern Norway, um, north of Tromsø, I would say. And um, yeah, and this time so it's a split shot. Um, and uh, yeah, you can still see 
the mountains in the background with a lot of snow and the and the sky of course are yeah, really really nice um this is actually what you have in norway all the time because um the year or in november the the arctic night is not already there of course but you don't get um so much daylight so that it's actually uh, the sun is com coming up barely touching the mountains actually and then already going down so that's why i said it's uh coming from a sunrise to a sunset immediately over a few hours but you always have so nice skies with this as well um i will come back to that because obviously yeah. it's a technical <laughs> shot as well um i also picked this one because this is also cold water obviously uh no actually not <laughs> really oh because yeah, what, 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 what would you guess it's the temperature here I don't know. I'm just looking at the guy. I'm assuming it's like at least 15 or something like that or 14 or something. No? Yeah, it's 20 degrees. 20. Wow. Yes. That's... Yeah. And this is like the only cave I know uh, where you have 20 degrees below 10 meters and above 10 meters, you have 28 degrees. Wow. And it's because of the thermal water. Uh, in Budapest and that um, cave it's called the Molna Janos it's in the middle of Luke Budapest and lies underneath Budapest and this is why you can dive there in really nice uh, warm water actually so you still want to have a dry suit because 20 degrees that's if you do a long dive or a proper dive then you don't want to be cold um, but you don't have that huge undergarment or whatever here in this case yeah but it's still very very nice yeah? and nice is that also with uh, Alex Dawson no, this was, uh, this is actually the owner. He's, he's called Attila, um, very famous name in Hungary, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there, but there's also in a uh, mine, an old yeah. uh, mine in Budapest. And there it's only 12 degrees, actually. Right. So I picked the wrong one then. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, but, but it still it's, would be the same in every other case. <laughs> this, I think, is from the same series. Yes, this is also Anna in Greenland, and here she's um, sitting on top of an iceberg, actually, and I'm also doing a split shot. And I think we uh, this was like a really tricky shot to do, and we can maybe talk about it uh, later as well to give you some more insights here. Yeah, uh, we'll do that. I think this is the last one because I picked this one because um, I think it, you won some award for this, the Underwater Photography Year in a category or the whole thing. <sighs> Uh, good question, actually. Uh, it won some awards, but uh, honestly, I can't tell you which ones exactly at the moment. It could be um, an award photographer of the year, I guess. But there was also a similar image with a similar um, well, this science is, make. This is from the underwater. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then it must hey, be. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's just the problem when you win so many awards, you know, you don't even remember. Yeah, that sounds a bit arrogant uh, and not <laughs> really good, but uh, it's, um, I, yeah, so I can't, um, I don't, I can't remember actually which, which pictures uh, by heart well, sometimes. Was uh, it the same trip with Alex or? Yes, uh, it was the same. Yeah, it was a week before Alex came actually. And there's uh, sometimes you have um, jellyfish, it's, they're called line, lines, mains. And, and they are drifting through the water. And I would say they are about uh, dish size, yeah, so a proper dish which you have on the table, uh, but not bigger, but it was really close to the camera as well. So, I mean, you could say that that trip really delivered quite a bit of, like, iconic photography for you, right? Yes, and I would also say that uh, all of the cold water destinations usually deliver more quality or more or better images more stunning images than on tropical destinations this is also was one of the reason reasons honestly why i wanted to go uh, more into cold water photography because i think um that not so many people are doing cold water of course because it's cold but um the the subjects there uh, what you can photograph are always um more um, away from the normality, what you usually photograph, and uh, like killer whales or icebergs. And I mean, everybody in theory can go on a tropical dive. Huh? The dive itself, it's not a, it's not a challenge. But um, of course, cold water diving is more challenging than tropical diving. But you also get much more rewards from this, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's kind of where I wanted to lead in because uh, <clears throat> I mean, I've done some cold water, but really not a lot. Um, so the appeal, I guess, is that you get just very different scenery, right? If you go to Raja Ampad, Palau, Maldives, uh, Caribbean, it's always blue. It's always nice corals. I guess that's the main draw, right? That it's so different. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah? And don't get me wrong, yeah? I love to dive in these regions as well. Yeah? Or I love to dive in Dominica with the sperm whales or go to Raja Ampat. Yeah? That's absolutely no question. But I like to throw in here and there and in between also some cold water dives. And then if you're a little bit used to it uh, and also to the setup and also to the things, then you have basically no limit anymore in terms of water or water temperature once you're used to dry suit diving and cold water. And so you can dive, I can dive everywhere actually. Yeah. And um, like if you talk about a bit more, because I think most people dialing in photographers, like what are some of these sort of equipment thoughts that you, you know, would have to take into account when you're, um, you know, going to go for cold water photography? Photography wise or diving wise? Well, I wanted to cover both, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, of course, for um, for diving-wise first, I would say, um, you need to have a good dry suit. And um, then it's also depending on which waters you want to take. So I have different dry suits for different uh, waters, actually. So a neoprene one, for example, you can really good use between 10 and 20 degrees, I would say, um, like because you can't get so much undergarment in uh, underneath. But if you want to dive below 10 degrees, um, then I would really recommend a, tr a good tri laminate uh, with a good undergarment. Uh, and also, and then it's a, like a question of a um, uh, little bit uh, re religious question uh, if you want to dive dry suit gloves or still wet gloves. Um, the wet gloves don't need to be necessarily be wet. They are very good systems and very thick uh, wet gloves as well, where almost no water comes inside as well. So it's a bit of a question on what you want. I really prefer to have dry gloves because you, after the dive, you just go out. Uh, you can get easily out of the glove and uh, really warm up your hands really good um, as well. But for the if you have uh, wet gloves and at least at least a little bit water, you need to have a towel and to get it clean and and your hands will get a little bit cold um, as well. But the dry gloves um, <laughs> are supposed to be dry. But I have so many uh, um, times I actually had when there was a leak or anything. So I would always have uh, have some spare um, gloves and also inner gloves with me when I'm on a on a dry suit dive as well. Yeah, because there there can be a leak always. Uh, so you just need yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is one good picture of uh, camera equipment um, outside in Greenland. Uh, where we can come through as well. So it's basically um, uh, equipment-wise for for um, uh, underwater photography um, in Greenland in really um, harsh conditions. You basically want to have a good um, underwater housing, I would say, like uh, Seacam, for example. I'm, I'm using I'm ambassador for Seacam, of course, yeah, so I can can say this. And because they have very good aluminium CNC housings, and they are very reliable as well as um, in cold conditions. And I barely find any situations where the housing really didn't work. But also because every day we're taking the housing back um, to the house and back home. So we're not staying outside over the night on the ice. Um, otherwise, I would uh, do definitely a, a different uh, preparation for this because, um, of course, the batteries are getting cold, the camera is getting cold. But if you go inside every night and you can store the housing dry and nicely, then it's absolutely no problem to take the housing just for the day outside. And also, I wouldn't open it um, anymore, the housing, um, if, I'm, if I'm out there in the cold. So just prepare the housing inside in the house as much as you can for batteries, fully charge everything, then go out with this, don't, don't open it anymore, and then you're actually basically good for the day. And yeah, the, the housings are, are, um, are really good. Um, they are not bothered by the cold uh, as, as we humans are. <laughs> so um, they work pretty well, I have to say, yeah. So, so what about, like, is there any thoughts like uh, O-rings? Do you need to do something differently in cold water uh, or any preparation, aside from the fact that obviously you're not opening it again? Yeah, no, you just have to to check it uh, better, actually, because especially if you have the housing out for a long time or for a long day or so, yeah, I would definitely always do a leak test before because the O-rings tend to shrink a little bit in the cold, yeah? So they, they, they just go a little bit. There are also O-rings for cold water or for, like, really cold um, outside temperatures, which you can exchange, but I never 
exchanged them actually um, to really proper cold water o rings, and they still did work really, really well. Yeah, just to make um, make it sure even better, or even more than you would usually do with, with, with your check. And if you go down, um, then just see if, if you have any leak left or not, or and then check the leak alarm, of course. Yeah, and then it shouldn't be a big problem. Okay, actually. Mac. So not much different. Actually, not. Yeah. Not not equipment wise, I would say, yeah. Better check it, of course, yeah. I mean, I would double check it uh, for sure. It's more the diving that it's more, much more challenging, especially in Greenland uh, when you are diving down. Um, the biggest problem in Greenland while diving is with the regulators. And um, don't ask me about manufacturers and stuff. Every regulator will fail and will have a free flow it's just a matter of time it's just the time difference yeah so they are manufacturers that having a free flow faster but at one point of time you will have a free flow from a regulator so it's always of course you have to have um, two stages with you and what i do is um I, every five minutes i breathe from another um, regulator actually yeah to both at the similar or the same time use the first stages so that they can, don't get um, too cold, but they will freeze and then at a certain point of time you will have a free flow. But I didn't have a free flow anymore since I was changing every five minutes. Huh? So you just like look at your computer every five minutes, doesn't need to be exactly, I can also be seven or three minutes, yeah, <laughs> doesn't matter. But the, the most important thing is that you use both first stages and both regulators at the uh, very good. Mm. And there's also one uh, other thing, um, because the the first um, layer in Greenland, for example, is fresh water. The fresh water will freeze earlier, actually, than the um, salt water. So the first meter you have when you are like in a hole and you dig your the hole in the ice and the fjord and you want to go down, it's um, it's a rule that you don't test breathe your regulator while you're on the surface, because this will make your regulator freeze immediately. Yeah, so. You, <laughs> you have to check everything before and need to be sure everything's working and trust the equipment. Then you uh, empty the BCD, actually. Um, you let yourself sink down to one meter or to one and a half meters, and then you will take your first breath. So you have to trust your equipment. Yeah, you can also prepare it at home already and, and test check it. Yeah, but at the site in Greenland, um, you only take your first breath when you're at one meter or two meters of depth, actually. Okay, and camera-wise, earlier, uh, uh, one of the viewers was asking uh, entry-level cameras. I know you work with Sea Life. What's your thoughts on plastic housings? Yeah, um, I would say they definitely are fogging up easier or are more attracted to the to the cold than aluminium housing. So I would always take a spare battery with me when um, I mean I always have anyways. Yeah, but especially with these housings. But there are also some like a little bit of camera bags which uh, protect the equipment. Yeah, I think Cine bags or how they are called. They have quite nice bags as well. But at the end. It's uh, it doesn't matter too too much, yeah. So I've seen a lot of housings as well in Greenland, um, and they were all doing pretty good actually, yeah. So the the main factor, the limiting factor, is really that you don't staying overnight uh, at the ice, so the equipment doesn't get really 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 cold. You can always warm it up a little bit, especially when you have the camera running a little bit, or once you're underwater and um, and uh, and, uh, uh, and using the camera and watching the, the the screen, it will always heat up a little bit as well just from the from the amount of um, warmth that the camera is uh, expanding as well right so in theory people could use a iphone housing because... yes i would definitely do um, like the sea life housing for example has a moisture mantra capsule inside which is very very good um, and i would definitely use that one instead of these um, how these are called the the, the packs which you put inside yeah, the uh, silicon packs. Yes, the silicon packs. Yeah, the moisture mancha capsules are much better to to get everything uh, from this. But also, I would do the same. I wouldn't uh, if I don't have to. Don't open the housing while you are outside in the cold, yeah, because sometimes the temperature change could cause the fogging. So right. that's especially in humid conditions. That's very much. But in Greenland, you don't, of course, the air is not so super humid, so it should be okay usually. But uh, I would just like don't like configure everything at home if you can, and then just don't open it anymore. Like you would regularly do on a boat trip as well or on a day trip. Yeah. So you just leave your camera inside the housing for the whole time and just try to to limit the times where you have to have to open to uh, the uh, the back of the housing.
Okay. Um, so let's talk business. Let's talk about some of these pictures. Um, yeah, you know, I said this was my favorite one. So um, you already gave us a situation and uh, Alex uh, was so kind to illuminate the bottom of the iceberg. But uh, I think photographers will be like, you know, wondering, I would personally wonder, you know, what's, what kind of settings are you using? Are we talking normal settings or uh, are you doing anything special? Yeah, pretty much normal settings. Um, I mean, the settings are always different um, when you're when you're trying to photograph. Here, um, as far as I remember, um, the ISO speed was a bit higher, and also I lowered down the shutter speed a little bit. I think in this case it was 160, and also the um, aperture was quite open because under the ice in Greenland, uh, the light conditions are just um, not as good. Yeah, it's nice and clear water. But um, because there's a lot of snow on the ice on the top, um, the sun, which uh, shimmers between the ice patches down, is not that much as you would expect. So you higher the ice a bit, you open up a little bit the aperture, lower the shutter speed, and then you get enough um, actually from it. You need to compensate a little bit and to work with it in uh, Lightroom and in the post-production a little bit to get all the um, dynamic range back into the image so that the, um, the, the parts where the light is shining through is not over, uh, overexposed uh, and also that uh, the part below, exactly, uh, and the part below the iceberg is also not underexposed and that you can still see something. Um, so you need to find a good balance um, with it. And what I always say in my courses is, check the image. <laughs> this is what I found that a lot of photographers use or tend to forget is they're taking an image and they're not checking at the back display if it's uh, going to be good or not. And um, even if they would think that it's good, um, you should have a close look um, onto the picture, maybe check also the histogram and see if uh, you have too many parts which are maybe um, too much exposed or too less exposed. Yeah? And then take a few images, yeah? So don't uh, take and change the settings. Yeah, um, don't uh, don't be satisfied with just one image, but uh, try to have uh, more multiple exposures, maybe if you can, if you have the time to. Yeah, just to be sure that you that you got the shot what you want. So when you're um, uh, taking these kind of photos, what kind of ISO are you um, doing? Um, good question. Um, I actually, yes. this um, image, uh, yeah, I would say in Greenland, um, it was still okay to be around between 400 and 800 ISO, but I'm um, talking Norway and the Orcas, it's a different story, but we will come to this in a minute as well, I guess. But uh, you said earlier highlights. Uh, somebody just asked, uh, you know, um, are you exposing for the highlights or for the dark areas? Are you slightly overexposing or rather underexposing? What are you doing here? Um, I definitely do underexpose uh, rather better because I definitely want to keep the highlights and if uh, something is a little bit, you can always push a little bit the, the, the dark areas and even if they are a bit more grainy, you, they are really good filters like noise filters which you can get it out. But definitely the highlights are the ones which, which I'm always uh, looking after and I would never overexpose the highlights. Yeah, I mean, here you could, it's a bit hard to see on the screen, but like this is like total danger zone, right? Here it's really dark and then suddenly there you could really get shot. So uh, yeah, over underexposing is here the name of the game. Right? Uh, what's the camera you're using? Because obviously the dynamic range changes a bit <laughs> per camera. Yeah. Are you using which camera? I have a Canon 1DX Mark II, uh, which has a quite high ra um, dynamic range actually. And, uh, but also, um, you have to know that the higher in ISO speed you go, the lower the, the dynamic range will also be on the camera. So just to have this in mind, yeah? So it's always like compensating. Um, but if you have not enough light, of course you need to do something, um, but you need to know what you're doing and how that will affect, of course, the image before you change some things. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, you've got really nice balanced shots. Uh, let's do another one. It's completely different. I picked that one. It's not in our original uh, selection, yeah. uh, but it's quite interesting because, uh, well, actually, just tell me what we're looking at here first. 
Yeah, okay, this is Anna uh, in between the icebergs. Uh, I would say in a depth of between eight to 10 meters, I would say. And there was, um, that is actually a piece of an original iceberg that was stuck in the top and she was just swimming in between. And um, for this image, I wanted to have, definitely have a little bit of light in her face as well. So I had two strobes with me that are lightening up the foreground so you can see everything in, the, in, the, in her mask and the lights as well. So, and this, of course, you need to balance with the with the ambient light as well so you have to have a look and um, to the ambient light as well and not to to have it too dark so you can still see um, the landscape behind her so does the um i mean the ice itself does it reflect the strobe light i could imagine that there could be some massive reflection going on if you don't pay attention mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it could be, but it's not really, really much. It's not like a mirror, yeah. So you can see that the that still see that the ice is sucking in the air a little bit. So there's um, the um, I would say it's a glassy surface, but underneath uh, it looks a little bit like snow as well, and that will also suck down, suck the um, the light a little bit, yeah. So it's not like a mirror. It's it's still okay. You can give a little bit of light, but of course I would always, um, no matter what I'm photographing, I'm always careful in. Um, in strobe light and don't uh, have too much power on the strobes and the, the strobes should actually only fill the darken areas where the light is needed and not like just illuminate the image because uh, you want to set light and not make a picture bright. So um, guys look at this uh, suit that, the, that Anna is wearing I mean that is not very thick and she is like posing and being nice and still um, her face is exposed um, you said she was cold, but uh, it's just a management of how does she does she, how does she manage? I mean, a six millimeter is pretty crazy in my eyes. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but um, because she was <laughs> moving a lot, of course, that compensates um, as well a lot. So. Um... Um, I got, for example, quite cold because I was always waiting for Anna, just a few minutes, of course, until she takes a breath and she's prepared again um, and so on and so on. But that non-moving underwater is really the killer, yeah? And usually I can, um, where we are diving 45 to almost 60 minutes in, in Greenland, but I would say 45 minutes, it's uh, already quite maxed out. But I've been in the water in Greenland also for one and a half hours once, um, but this was a lot of moving for me underwater as well. And if you, the more you're moving, of course, the more energy you can also extend, and the warmer you will get. And this is actually the the, the key in this in this case. Yeah. So also for Anaya, once she was out, she can have a hot tea and uh, put herself like uh, in um, or like uh, warm up the the hands again with hot water, or also the feet and so on and so on. And she had like uh, three jackets to put on <laughs> after the dive as well. Uh, and then she was uh, quite okay, I have to say. So, um, I mean, here you're you're waiting for her at depth, I suspect. I suspect yeah? So, like, what is this, like 10 meters or? Uh, yeah, 15 maybe, yeah. 10, 15 meters or so, yeah. But it won't get any colder, yeah, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> yeah, but you said you have to wait there for her to come back down. Right? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, the waiting part was, uh, was, was for me the, the most challenging part in terms of uh, coldness, definitely. Yeah? So if you have to wait and do nothing, and I also want to make sure um, that she's uh, fine on the, her way down and up. Yeah? So I'm watching her all the time uh, when she's in the water or underwater. Um, yeah, then, of course, you get a little bit cold as well. And actually, the, the part uh, on the face, because I'm also wearing a, a wet uh, hood, of course, yeah, that's not dry. Um, you can feel, this is what you feel immediately, is the coldness um, on your skin of the, of the eyes. And this is, it's like little stitches um, going into your skin. But uh, after five minutes, it's okay, because then the skin is so cold that it's, uh, you can't feel it anymore. <laughs> right, the, the pores are closed up then. <laughs> yes, yeah. And it's like if you have an ice spray or something, yeah? if, you, if, if you have something what hurts and you make an ice spray or for sports or soccer or so, they have these ice sprays that makes it better immediately yeah? or before you get, I don't know, yeah, um, an injection or so. <laughs> yeah. So that's not your biggest worry. I just uh, picked this other picture. So I, I had a, bit, a couple of backup images um, mm -hmm. because, they, because we talked about the highlights. Uh, I could imagine this was quite challenging here um, uh, to get the balance right of darkness and, and highlights. 
Yes, definitely. Yeah. So you really have to take uh, take care here and see that you have a good balance. But I also, in this case, uh, had a little bit of light from my strobes onto the iceberg, actually. So this what also was really nice. So this is what I meant. Don't make a picture bright, but see where the light is actually needed. So I had a little bit of power of the strobes towards so here. The this is actually yes. with strobe light. Yes, a little bit uh, more up, I would say, yeah, in the middle of the image, um, because I also didn't want to have the the iceberg just um uh, bright also on the bottom but uh, i just want to like imitate a little bit the sunlight so i put it a little bit more up into the middle of the iceberg to lighten up the darks a little bit not much but i think and you don't see that really in the image but i know that i had the strobe on and uh, i know how the uh, image looked like without the strobe or with too much uh, a strobe light so you want to find the the balance actually between um, a good lightning and not uh, not enough lightning and too much lightning. Cool. All right. Um, so this was kind of the iceberg situation. Now that's uh, maybe not for everybody so attainable uh, as uh, orcas. Yeah. So cold water free diving is a completely different thing. Um, so if we talk about this image here, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the situation first. Like how do you actually get to be with the orca uh, in, in the water like that. Yeah, so this is actually the most challenging part to get in the water with the orcas um, because usually, or actually what the orcas are doing there, um, they are hunting the mid-Atlantic herring, which is there to overwinter in the fjords. And um, so the first thing would be um, to see or to find the herring, but you don't see the herring underneath the surface, of course, but you have a pretty good guess if there are a lot of orcas around. But um, the orcas are not always hunting the herring, of course. Yeah, This is only, unfortunately, the rarest part when you can see them really hunting the herring. But um, they are also traveling. And uh, sometimes we have the chance when you see a group and a pot of orcas, you can go into in the water with them and they're just traveling and passing by. So this is like most of the situations in, in Norway uh, where it can take a really good guess. And you get, of course, the jackpot if they are staying there at a bait ball with the herring when they are really surrounding the, um, the, the herring. And then, of course, you get yeah, exactly uh, um, this image uh, where you have a couple of orcas uh, hunting um, a school and a bait ball of herring. This is like the jackpot, what you want to have. But, of course, you don't always get it. And on the last uh, image, what you had with the, the split shot, um, there was a situation where actually um, there were some orcas around a um, herring net from fishermen. Yeah? So not actually the situation I would like to photograph, but it was a really, really nice opportunity to go in uh, the water with the, with the orcas. And they were just swimming around that fishing net always. Um, not hunting, of course, they're not going into it, but they were just interested, of course, by the smell, I guess, yeah, but uh, by the sounds of the herring um, and so on and so on. And this was actually the case where I could go into the water and uh, take some underwater shots really nicely, but I also um, wanted uh, desperately to have some split shots of the orcas. And uh, that was really a nice opportunity here to do this. So, yeah, I mean, let's talk maybe about first the, the general problem of photographing mm -hmm. orcas in this sort of conditions. Um, this is, I guess, the kind of the, the situation that you will have most of the time, pretty, uh, pretty dark. Yes, yeah, and this is like the most challenging part in, in Norway as well regarding to photography. And, and as I said before, um, the, of course, the orcas are there um, starting from November um, to, I would say, early February. Uh, and the only possibility for us to visit them there and to go in the water is in November and also in end of January, beginning of February sometimes, but then the season is already over. So I would say mid of November, like our trip is definitely the best time to see the orcas there because you still have um, a little bit of light you know, still and not um, have the, the, um, the Arctic night, which will come then in December or over um, Christmas where it's, where it's dark the whole day. Yeah, So you won't see any light. It will be bl um, uh, pitch black um, outside. And here you have, uh, for a couple of hours, you have some daylight actually. But as I said, you don't see the sun. Yeah, It barely comes above the mountains in the, in, in the fjords. So you have 
um, you barely have direct sunlight. That means the um, ISO exposures um, are very high, actually. Yeah? So we're talking for these kind of shots. Um, I would say I think I at least used um, ISO 2500. Wow. Uh, for these shots or 3200 wow. uh, with a super open aperture on f4 my fisheye lens is like the fastest speed my fisheye lens can do you could also use um, 2.8 uh, with a 2.8 lens but also then you have to mind or uh, think a little bit about um, sharpness actually yeah so if you're literally on open aperture like super wide open the sharpness will be limited uh, in the whole picture it's not a really big issue when you're photographing wide angle lenses like a fish eye, fish eye lens then you still have sharpness all over the image but for example this image was shot it's a split shot shot on open aperture f4 and usually um, you would like if you're shooting split shots you would like to use a closed aperture that means at least 18 20 22 maybe but it was just impossible yeah because you don't get enough light and if i would use a more closed aperture like um, 18 or so then the whole image would be dark and i have no orca in the image so you need to know where you ha can compensate actually a little bit and where you get the light so as i said this shot i think it was iso 2500 f4 and I had, um, I think, one sixtieth of a second or a two hundredth of a second of speed because uh, we are not using any strobes uh, with the orcas in uh, in Norway um, because that could uh, be a bit afraid. They could be a bit afraid of the of the strobe, but because also um, you are much faster in the water with just a camera and not have an additional strobe with you. Huh? So you don't want to have any motion blurness in your image so you want to have the speed at least at the 160 or 200 so this is what you are limited actually in terms of photography where you can't go lower than this but you can open the aperture higher the iso and i rather have a grainy image but it's a nice image than to have no image <laughs> I think this worked also really well because the orca is not super close to you. So the focus yeah. point is, is, is relatively far away from the camera. So you, the, your, your, your mountains are still pretty sharp overall looking there. Yes, yeah. If you look, have a look, a closer look or see the image um, in full resolution, you would see that they, of course, the, the mountains are not uh, crystal or clear and sharp. But for, I think for the image, it still works uh, at, at this image yeah? because you get the atmosphere, you know that these are mountains yeah? and the main subject is anyway the orca. So you need to balance um, also the light which you have and this is like the compensation you have to do otherwise you then don't get any shot. <laughs> well, and you know, it's, it's also, you know, the probably one of the few split shots that are out there. So, you know, as long as there's yeah. not a big competition and nobody's ever managed to do a split shot, uh, I, I can't remember seeing anybody else having split shots from Norway. Uh, then, you know, it, it, it's as good as it gets. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, any tips for for photographers uh, about the, you know, the, the dome, preparing the dome for as little runoff as possible. You do have a little bit here, but not much, mm. uh, considering that you were probably in a pretty rough water there. Um, what, do you do anything to your dome? Do you get it ready? Um, yeah, so before I'm taking a split shot, I actually, um, <laughs> I spit on the dome pot like you would spit in the mask and just rub the upper part uh, a little bit and then I dump it into the, into the sea so it can rinse off and that gives me actually um, really, um, or it like, decreases the um, drops what you have on the dome pot a lot, I would say. Yeah, you have to renew this every from time to time, um, of course, after a few minutes. So to think about it, to to spit again on your dome pot if you have a little bit of time, if maybe the orcas are not around. But this is like the best preparation what I found is um, you know, for split shots. It's like just spit on the dome pot, dip it into the water again, and then you have really you decrease the the drops by a lot by by a lot. Is this the net here? Hmm? Is this the net? Yes, this is the net in the background. Mm. You can see it like a little bit in the in the distance. And also, of course, the the um, visibility underwater in Norway is not the best. Um, I would say if you have a good day, then you have 15, 20 meters maybe. Um, but usually you can also have only five or 10 meters. Yeah, it's in the middle of the fjord. It's very saturated, the water there as well, yeah. And um, of course, there's also a little bit of compensation, so you can barely see the net in the in the in the background here in this case, which I prefer as well yeah, to not see the net <laughs> in this case. Um, but if you know this and if you know the story, of course, 
it's it's there. And um, uh, I mean, if I look at this, it's crazy flat. The water. I mean, that's not kind of the water that we expect in Norway. Is this because it's behind the net, or was that just a flat day? Yeah, it was actually. Um, it's never really flat, flat, of course. But um, this fishing net was actually in a nice um, location, so that was a little bit um, inside the fjord and as well near the shoreline in another little bay where the water was really protected. Um, but yes, yeah, you can. You you never know where the orcas are at the end, and then you have to deal with the with the situation. But in this time, I was in this this time I was lucky, and I got. Uh, quite good and flat sea but at the end it's just a matter of um, holding the camera in the right way yeah uh, um, that you have a good feeling for the for the balance between in the waves and also what's a good tip as well put if you are not um, firing the strobes anyways when you're doing the split shots then put your camera on um, burst mode and then spray and always in burst mode spray and pray <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so you, do you do burst mode three shots or how many shots do you do in burst mode? Uh, no, continuous, continuous. Yeah, continuous. Uh, mm, so I think the 1DX can do, I think, up to 150 shots on one time. And then it needs to store a little bit more and it goes uh, um, a little bit slower, but the camera can do 14 shots in a second. So that's really not too bad. Lots of deleting images afterwards. Which yeah, you, yeah, lots of looking through, yeah. <laughs> I know you hate deleting images, so... Uh, I never do it. <laughs> Even if you I have... Can't. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't delete any images, yeah, really? because the... Yeah, I, I'm keeping all the images, um, uh, at least because the hard drives and the disk space is so cheap, so I have two disks, actually, just for raw images, which I didn't use, like for... 90% of what you what you have on the trip. I just put them on there. So they are there. They are backed up uh, and they are and you know what I mean? You don't uh, lose them and in case you still can go back and see if they if you have maybe another image which you have overseen for example, yeah, or like another angle and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, guys, I, I'm going to put one more picture to discuss, but um, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a comment section. So you can pop some more comments in there if you have specific questions for Tobias. We have like another 10 minutes or so to go, and I will ask uh, questions that I see popping up. Um, I think the, the one image that, uh, that we could still discuss is here, this one in the, uh, in the I think it was a, a mine, right? Or is it a cave? This is the um, cave huh? in Budapest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I know what I'm looking at in terms of what you've done with lighting, but maybe uh, you can explain the audience what you've done here. Um, also what your your buddy is doing there. Yes, yeah. So it's a kind of um, slave strobe photography, which we call it. And it's just to create some more light in the cave where your strobes from your camera are actually not reaching. Yeah? So the plan is that my strobe, which I put on really low power, is actually via a strobe cable or a slave strobe cable, which that diver here in the front has one in his hands and one on his back, is actually also lighting up to give more actually that this diver is actually lightening the scene and not the strobe what you have on your camera, just to give more atmosphere, more depth in the picture, um, lighting from a different point. And this actually makes the image. It's it's very, um, I was not the inventor of this, of course, yeah, <laughs> but uh, especially in, in cave photography, but also in racks, that can be very, very nice, actually, because you are creating an atmosphere and some external lightning, which will actually actually lighting lighting light up the scene, and which usually looks much much nicer than if you would just lit up the the scene with your strobes from your camera. So this is a quite um, useful technique, uh, especially yes. in caves or if you're inside. Uh, so, some... so here, if I see this correctly, the, that's one of the strobes that's firing backwards, and then he's exactly. holding the sensor in his hand, right? Is that the exactly? Sensor? And then is that the other one up there? Yes, correct, yeah. So you had two one, one firing um, to the back and one firing a little bit lower. Um, and the one at the top also had a sensor pointing back or is that just the retro, is that the retro strobe up there? Uh, no, it's all, all sequence also strobes. Sequence. Um, but you had the two, I had two cables with two sensors and he was holding them in my direction. Uh, he's holding two cables. Yes, yeah. Uh, the other one is, I think maybe we also fixed it in somewhere on his uh, on his uh, PCD. It's already a few years ago where we took this picture, actually. 
So yeah, for everybody who's watching, uh, just pay attention to how well this is lit. Normally, if you would just you know shoot from the front, you you would literally just light up the guy and maybe this area here. But your strobes would never reach that far back. So if you have this uh, uh, this guy help you like this, your buddy, then you know you can you can light up much much further back, and you actually get a, a much bigger three dimensional feeling in uh, in the cave. Correct. Yeah. And the quality of light is also much better. Yeah, I mean, it's also very clear, the water, right? So you can do yes, these things, yeah, right? yeah, sure, yeah. And what kind of settings do you use here? Um, good question. Yeah, this was um, also um, quite open aperture, I guess, like um, I think eight, uh, maybe, uh, which was still okay. And maybe, uh, but the, I think the... I can't remember actually <laughs> which setting I was. I think the ISO speed, but this was actually quite normal settings yeah, because you're anyway working with um, artificial light only. So the only light source which you have, which of course doesn't come from the sun, will be the strobes. And you can, and every light in that image will come from the strobes. So you can steer everything um, of the strobes. It's also depending on the power of the strobes you want to give them. So if you want to have less power, uh, of the strobes and you go a little bit higher with the with the ISO speed of course but here you can it does matter for example if the shutter speed is a 60th of a second or 200th of a second um, the light will be the same actually yeah just balance it maybe from the from the light um, of the torch that the diver in the background has that's the only limiting factor because this is the only light which shines but the rest will come from the um, from the strobes mm. so we'll always um Somebody just asked about that cable. So this this cable that we see there, that's that's not like a normal optical cable, right? No, it's um, actually um, CCAM uh, only now has a new strobe, which can also take an optical cable. But um, the C-Flash 150Ds, which I have, they need to have a proper uh, normal S6 cable, it's called. But there you can attach um, a slave strobe sensor, which has a little light or like a little sensor, light sensor in it. And once my strobe for my camera is firing, it gives like a little impulse uh, of light then the the other um, strobe uh, or this sensor um, at the end of the strobe cable will get triggered and then the other strobes also firing so it's like a um, chain reaction thing so um um but for if you have a strobe like the inon z330 or uh, also the retra flash mm -hmm. um even even the cnc uh, ones they all have these little sensors so if you're pointing the strobe backwards, do you think that would be sufficient to create the same effect? Um, I'm, or... this, this depends a little bit on the strobe, actually. Yeah? So some of the strobes have that sensor in the front and some have that in the back. Yeah? So you need to know on your specific strobe what you're using, where that little light sensor is, which triggers the strobe. But I have to say with all these um, slave strobe cables and sensors that it's, sometimes it's not very reliable. And the better it will work the darker the environment is or the, the darker the environment is the better it will work of course and if you still have a lot of light like in Rex and Egypt or so uh, sometimes then sometimes it doesn't get triggered because the surrounding light is so um, so much so for some shots and some rack shots for example I'm using a 10 meter um, strobe cable and really placing the strobe there and then just rolling it out to the so I know for sure that it will 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 fire so this is of course most reliable but yeah you need to find out a little bit also the placement of the sensor if you use use a slave strobe sensor then it needs to be placed very well and also you do have to fire your own strobe as well which you also need to be concerned of uh, how much light you want to give in the front so I sometimes I don't, don't necessarily want to have light in the foreground, so, but I still have to fire my own strobe. So this is a bit tricky. So this is why I really actually like to use a long um, strobe cable for some settings. But in a cave, you can't do anything else, actually, because you don't want to have another long cable in a cave, which is anyway difficult to dive. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So you're shooting it at super low power. Is that correct? Yeah like the lowest possible or? No, or... that totally depends actually on which ISO speed I am and which aperture speed I am. Um, but it, I would say for these shots, it was maybe 25% power um, or even a little bit lower. 
a maximum 25%, I would say. Okay. Not too much, yeah? not on full power. But sometimes it needs to be full power, yeah? If you place the, the, the strobe behind something or so, and if you want to have really, like, backlit it, yeah, then it's on full power. It, you can't say that, like, as an overall rule, how much power it has. It is totally depending on the, on the situation. Um, cool. All right, then I'm going to ask you about the last po picture. Haha, <laughs> that's not, uh, yeah, no, obviously, uh, I do want to mention to everybody who's here that uh, Toby and me are going to be running an Orca trip, not in January, but in November in the best time. I mean, what can you tell people to get excited about this Norway trip? By the way, guys, we have uh, six six spots left um or five sorry five so uh, if you want you can message me uh um or or uh, toby uh but uh, yeah if you want to join us in november uh toby why is this going to be a good trip it will be for sure a good trip um for sure because just the the surroundings there in norway and the fjords and the whole atmosphere to to go on the liverboard through these fjords is so great uh and all these this this is really this is an arctic trip as you would say it but you still have all the comfiness you want to uh on the boat you can you don't have to be outside you can always get get inside have a hot coffee yeah so you won't get cold if you don't really want to if you you can also see the orcas through the window yeah probably so for sure we're going to see orcas yeah or this is like pretty much sure um the only risk is of course if you can get in the water or not this is nature yeah and it can also be very windy and very uh bad weather there of course so there could be a day where we where we can't go out um of course but um the the it's if you see the orcas then yeah and if you have the chance to see the orcas underwater this is so rewarding yeah because um you know what you've what you've been through um to see the orcas it's cold outside it's the arctic we as you can see in the videos we need to spot them first yeah and then see um if we can get in the water it's not as you would go to roger Ampart and uh, okay there's the manta point for sure there will be mantas yeah um this is different in the in the arctic or in cold water um trips definitely and but it's so much more rewarding once you're there and uh, once you actually have seen an orca and i would always say that it's every i mean i've been there five times already but every time i'm i'm there and there's an orca next to the boat or to the zodiac and uh, the orca is taking the first breath that breath sound is so magic when you when you see the orca this and you can see this is i mean this is the, the apex predator of the ocean yeah and they even the these hunt the orcas are even hunting white sharks yeah so i can't remember any animal which is uh, which wants to fight uh, with an orca and being in the water there with these gentle giants and they are seeing you of course but it's absolutely no danger to to go there and there i mean absolutely not da no danger is also not true because there's always a danger yeah <laughs> if you're in the nature if you just go over the street there's danger possibly yeah so but they can see you uh and they already distinguish quite good that you're just not interested you're just there as an observer and they know this um as far as they have the feeling uh feeling for and then to really be in the water with an orca and he's looking at you and with this apex predators just this gives you goose skin and this is one of the best animal or maybe the best animal encounter i've i've, I've ever or animal encounters i've ever had in, in in the water i would say was with the hunting orcas and the herring in northern norway that was the best thing i've i've ever seen underwater it was absolutely amazing and this is the why why i think we everybody needs to see this once in a lifetime in, in my eyes yeah, it's absolutely stunning and amazing well, I'm really looking forward to it. We planned it already twice and had to cancel. So I'm really, really excited about uh, going and having you there to uh, show me the ropes because, you know, I haven't done it yet. Um, but uh, maybe one thing that, because I know some people are also joining because they are thinking about it. Um, I often get this question like, well, maybe not everybody likes it because I hate the cold. Mm. I mean, do you, do you, in the five times that you were there, do you, were there any people that like hated it or, you know, Oh, mine, I would say it's inconvenient, <laughs> but um, I mean, if you go to Northern Norway, you know that it's going to be cold at one point of time. But um, this is not the topic, because if you see an orca that close, you don't think about the coldness anymore and everything is worth it. Yeah. So um, I would also not over prioritize the coldness because you can always do something to warm up again and always could be could be uh, be prepared and, and nobody, of course, 
it will be, can be cold at one point of time, but nobody's talking about this in a bad way. It's everybody always was so cold, but it was so fun to see the orca still, yeah? So I don't mind it, yeah? So this is not the thing. You don't go in there because you want to freeze. You're going there to see the no to see the orcas. And of course, it's a little bit free. If you go out for a hike in the winter in your uh in your country maybe if you live in or whatever like or for skiing yeah, and then it's also possible that you get cold a little bit yeah so i wouldn't build too much drama about it yeah it's at the end it's all good and you can warm up of course uh all the time and you don't need to be in fear of the cold yeah so if you're if it's too cold if you want to say uh okay that's too cold for me you can just always go back to the big boat and and uh, hop in and have a have a coffee and go inside again yeah so this is this is absolutely not the problem. Cool. Well, I think we've done enough uh, marketing. So, guys, if you want to join us, you know, join us uh, in November. Okay. Well, um, before we close, um, I didn't see too many questions aside from the ones that I already asked. Um, what What else is coming up? I mean, what's What's this year? What else is What else cool projects are you doing this year? Doing more workshops, more trips. What, what else can people do with you? Just give us a bit of an idea of twenty twenty two still has in in check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to Egypt tomorrow for a week uh, for a new boat uh, and doing some shots there. And right after I'm going to Italy to a small island called Elba also for a workshop. So if anybody's interested, of course, there are still seats um, and places open there. Um, but of course, I will also do have some more workshops in Egypt during the year and also some other projects which are not finalized yet. And um, but there will be something coming um, also for Scuba Pro probably. Uh, and also in the South Sea, I hope, uh, in summer. So just stay tuned and uh, follow. Please follow me also on Instagram, and then you can see all the updates. Yeah, guys, make sure you follow Tobias Friedrich uh, on, his, uh, on his Instagram. Uh, I recommend checking out the website, a really beautiful website with all the images, uh, several books that he's written. Um, I can also recommend his uh, photography book. is one of the better photography books that are out there I would say uh, the best together with Alex uh, Mustard's book so uh, you can order them directly I think from Toby if I remember yes. correctly mm -hmm. in German or in English um, if you're learning photography guys I can only recommend uh, go on a trip with Toby because you're going to learn so much um, you know all day you can you can uh, bore him with your questions and, you know, <laughs> and tape. Uh, now you had one hour but looking forward on a trip you do a lot um, <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for joining and uh, it was a real pleasure to have you. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah, and it's a pleasure that I could join you here live on Instagram. And uh, I'll see you in Norway when we're really cold together. Latest <laughs> in Norway, exactly. Yeah? And having a few beers in, there, in the hot spa in the night to talk about the nice orca encounters during the day. I absolutely cannot wait to sit in the hot tub after seeing the orcas, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. For Welcome. Uh, any questions or other questions didn't cover, like send them to either of us. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of the week, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.